Do you ever get tired of eating in a chair? Huh? Well, maybe next time you could try. This is called the Garden Party Relief, created around 645 BC. It depicts Ashurbanipal, one of the last great kings of Assyria, feasting while reclining on a banqueting couch, with his queen seated beside him. Here is another relief, this time from the Temple of Athena of the ancient Greeks, where a group of men are eating, also while lying on their side. Similar scenes are visible in Greek pottery, and in this fresco wall painting within the tomb of the diver. The ancient Greeks called this type of gathering a symposium, although today this word is used to describe a conference where experts convene to discuss a particular subject, the word symposium originally meant to drink together, and it took place after the meal, when alcohol and conversation flowed freely, and guests enjoyed all sorts of entertainment such as music, poetry, and dancing. Some houses even had a specific room dedicated for hosting symposiums, called an andron. Andron literally means of men, so women were not allowed in. Well, unless they were slaves, entertainers, or courtesans, then you were more than welcome to join. Even architecturally, the andron was separated from the rest of the house, often with an antechamber and offset doors, providing an extra layer of privacy to the events unfolding within. This culture of drinking and feasting also became popular among the Etruscans, who traded with the Greeks. At a time when Rome was still just a small little city-state, Etruria was the dominating force in the Italian peninsula, and the Etruscans were a cultural powerhouse. The Latin alphabet, gladiatorial combat, and hydraulic engineering. Many of the things that we recognize as key elements of Roman civilization were heavily influenced by the Etruscans. Here we have what is considered one of the greatest masterpieces of Etruscan art, the sarcophagus of the spouses. Made out of terracotta, the sarcophagus shows a couple lying on a dining couch with cushions to help keep them propped up. Isn't their posture starting to look very familiar? Eventually, the Romans would conquer the Etruscans, and they too would feast in similar fashion, but the Romans took it to the next level. There is a saying that all roads lead to Rome, and along those roads arrived an immense variety of ingredients sourced from the vast reaches of the Roman Empire. Fresh seafood, wild game, aromatic spices, wine, and whatever else you may desire, they had it all. And as Rome flourished, the culture of partying all night long while lying down on a couch became increasingly popular, especially amongst the elites and ruling classes. If the Greeks had their androns, then the Romans had their triclinium's. Triclinium literally means a three-couch room, and this was the formal dining room where lavish banquets would be held. The three couches of a triclinium would usually hold three people, although sometimes as many as four would lay on the couches. They would be arranged in a U-shape around a central table that was accessible to all of the diners. One side was left open in order to allow household slaves to continuously serve courses throughout the evening. So what did they eat? Expensive ingredients such as oysters, lobsters, pheasants, and wild boar were popular. Extravagant dishes such as stuffed or mouse and parrot tongue fricasse were appreciated. Even foods that were banned by sumptuary laws, laws that were put in place to prevent excess luxury, were consumed nonchalantly. These included dishes such as fat and fowl and sow's udders. And of course, plenty of wine was served to accompany all these fine foods. One legendary feast was hosted by Elagabalus, who became emperor at the young age of 14. Notorious for his extreme eccentricity and decadence, the teenage emperor is said to have served the following at one of his grand receptions. Camel's feet, honey dormice, the brains of 600 ostriches, conger eels fattened on Christian slaves, caviar from fish caught by the emperor's private fishing fleet, and a sauce made by a chef who had to eat nothing but that sauce if the emperor didn't like it. Man, that was one spoiled teenager. But coming back to posture, why did all of these ancient civilizations eat while lying down? For the Romans, the reason was twofold. First, it allowed them to enjoy the festivities for as long as possible. Let's imagine that you were invited as a guest to one of these exclusive events. After your day's business had concluded, you would hit the baths to freshen up, then make your way over to the host residence for around 5pm, 
From there, you could be looking at up to 10 hours of revelry ahead of you. When faced with the prospect of such a marathon of an event, lying down starts to sound very appealing. If you got tired at any point, you could take a quick nap on the couch between courses. And it was believed that lying down on a comfortable couch, especially on your left side, helped with digestion. In fact, a study of more than 700 illustrations of banquet culture between the 7th and 4th centuries BC found that not a single banqueter was lying on their right side. Lying on your left side enhances the natural curvature of the stomach. Compared to lying on your right side, this provides more room for food to fit in and controls the risk of reflux. The second reason why the Romans ate lying down was because it represented status and power. Generally, the only people who were able to feast in this horizontal position were the upper classes, and even among them, it was a privilege reserved for the men only. If women were in attendance, they had to eat at another table or sit upright beside the men. It wasn't until the later stages of ancient Rome that women could participate in banquets as equals among their male counterparts. And these opulent dinner parties were not just about having a good time with friends. They were crucial arenas to network, strengthen bonds with your allies, and keep an eye on your rivals. The level of food, entertainment, and even tableware being provided would be a direct reflection of the host's political power and wealth. And so hosts would try to one-up each other by serving up the most exotic dishes imaginable in order to impress their guests. Even the couch that you sat on had great significance. The middle couch was reserved for the guests with the highest status, while the left couch was for the hosts and the right was for those with lower status. Social hierarchy was strictly recognized in ancient Roman society and it manifested itself clearly within the walls of the triclinium. But other than your posture, here are a few pointers to fit right into a Roman banquet. If you need to go to the washroom, ask a slave to bring you a piss pot so that you don't have to get up. Feeling gassy? Let her rip! The Romans believed that holding on to gas could be fatal. Emperor Claudius, who reigned from 41 AD to 54 AD, even issued an edict to encourage farting during meals. Food fell on the floor? Leave it! Romans believed that anything that fell from the table was reserved for the dead and should not be retrieved. They even liked to install mosaic floors of scattered leftovers in their banquet halls, so that the real food scraps could be nicely camouflaged. Getting a little too full? Use a feather to tickle the back of your throat so that you can throw up and empty your stomach. Now you're ready to get right back to eating. While the Romans' banqueting style may have faded into the sands of time, their devotion to culinary enjoyment has made waves that reverberate to this day. Even nowadays, Italians are famous for their passion for food, and Italian cuisine is loved all around the world. And whether we eat in our chairs or on our couches, one thing will never change. That one of the most important things in life is to share good food with good people.